Welcome to Whitefields Community Church Sermon Extra. I'm here with Pastor Nick Cady of Whitefields Community Church, and we're glad to have you with us. We have started a new series in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, if you were with us on Sunday morning or you listened online. Uh, if you haven't listened, go to whitefieldschurch.com and you can uh, listen there, download the um, sermon, or it'll be in the comments section below. And uh, we're excited about this new series, about what God's going to teach us and and. Going through the book of Romans, it changes your life, and uh, it, and we're looking forward to to what's going to happen in the in the weeks and months to come as we study this book and we learn about the gospel. And that was one of the main topics that we talked about on Sunday morning: is what is the gospel? And that's my first question for you today: is what is the gospel? Yeah, I think that um, it's really important that we clarify what that is because I think a lot of people are unclear on that. And so the answer is this, the gospel by its very definition of what it means as a word, uh, as its etymology, so to say, it is the good news. It is not good advice. It is good news of what Jesus has done for us. Now, of course, there are implications for that, for how we should respond to it, but we, we shouldn't confuse the implications of the gospel with the gospel itself. The gospel, the good news is a declaration. It's a proclamation of what Jesus has done for us in history in order to rescue us. And that's what it tells us in verse 16 of chapter 1, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of, of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. And then we got to verse 17. We talked about the word faith, for it says, for it in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. And then faith is one of those words in the Bible that, you know, in our modern vernacular, it has taken on a new meaning. It's like the word hope, the word love. You know, when people use the word hope, they say, well, I hope something happens. Or, you know, nowadays, who knows what the word love actually means. But in, in, our, in biblical terms, faith is, is what, what does faith truly mean? Yeah, you know, I think if you go to like Hobby Lobby and buy one of those wood things that says like, uh, you know, I have the word family, faith, and I don't know what the other one is, uh, <laughs> SUVs or something. Right. I don't know what people like these days. So, uh, yeah, but yeah, people use the word faith. I think in our culture, they use it to mean optimism. Like, you know, the Little League team is down by 13 runs and there's two outs in the ninth inning. And we tell them, you know, put on your rally caps because we got to have faith or the Broncos are terrible again and they're losing. And you say, you just got to have faith. You got to have faith in the system. You got to have optimism, right? And so we use that word, I think, to mean optimism, somebody's got a diagnosis, we tell them, hey, you just got to have faith. We don't really ever clarify what that faith is in or what we mean by that. Um, but faith needs to have an object, right? So when the Bible talks about faith, it's, uh, it would, I would define it this way. Christian faith is believing what God says enough that you do it. And uh, it means believing something enough that you act upon it. And so I, I thought of an analogy, you know, if you were standing on top of a, say, three-story building and it was on fire and the firefighters come and they stretch out that thing that catches you, you know, I might look at that and I might have a, a lot of trouble believing that that thing would actually catch me or that they would catch me, right? They'd get it, it direction, like I'd fall and then they, I saw the cartoon, right, where the guy falls next to the thing that catches them, right? I, I would have a hard time believing that this is actually going to work. But yeah, if I stepped off and I said, okay, I'm going to do it, that would be an example of the kind of faith that the Bible is talking about. It's faith that, that is willing to act um, because it believes that I'll act and, and this will come through, even if I have a hard time uh, struggling with doubts to actually believe. Mm -hmm. Because we believe in a God that is true, and believe in a God whose promises are yes and amen, and believe in a God who has never, never let, let us down. And uh, as we preview for, for the next week and for the weeks to come, one of the things, and people have brought it up. One of the things about Romans is that it hits you really, really hard. Mm -hmm. You know, as you get into the first few chapters, it's like, where are we going with this? This is, you know... <laughs> Does it hit you like a freight train? It hits me like a freight train, like the one out the window. <laughs> <laughs> So there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about sin, the depravity of man. You know, in, in chapter 3, verse 9, it goes, There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands, none who seeks. They've all turned away. There's none who does good. All have sinned. All have fallen sh short of the glory of God. So why does Paul start out this way? 
Oh, yeah. It's kind of one of these things uh, where, you know, it's kind of like, hey, I've got some good news and some bad news. Let me give you the bad news first. But it's more than that because we don't actually, the good news isn't actually good news unless you understand why it's good news, right? Like if there's nothing to be saved from, then salvation isn't thrilling. It's not exciting. It's not even worth your time, right? Like, um, yeah, I, what's interesting, I think the thing that you need to keep in mind is that this is a section that begins at verse 18 of chapter 1, and it ends at verse 20 of chapter 3. And what's really interesting about that is that the verse right before it and the verse right after it both contain this phrase, the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. And I told a story on Sunday about Martin Luther and about how he had said at one point in his life, he began to hate that term, the righteousness of God. He hated it because he felt that every time it was used, it was always used in the sense of God's righteous and you're not, and God's disappointed in you and God is fed up with you. And he said, so whenever he saw that word in the Bible, righteousness of God, it just kind of made him cringe or, or kind of upset inside. And he said, though, but he was teaching a Bible class because he was a monk mm -hmm. and he was teaching from the Psalms. And there was a verse that said, your righteousness saves us. And that totally went against the way that he had thought about righteousness. And so he, he kind of kept that in his mind. And later on, when he read Romans chapter one, verse 17, that in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed from faith to faith. Then he said it all clicked. That was his breakthrough. When he understood that the righteousness of God is actually a comfort to us because in the gospel, the good news is that God gives us his righteousness so that we can stand before him, so we can be right with him. And so the, the righteousness of God is not a bad thing, but a good thing. And so what these verses do is they contrast God's good righteousness with our unrighteousness. Um, and the only reason it does it, though, is not just to make us feel bad or make us feel scared of God. It is to make us understand how glorious and how good this salvation is, how absolutely we need it. That's the other thing is that if you don't need it, then then you probably just don't care. And I think that's where our society's at a lot of times this, these days is that a lot of people, you tell them, hey, Jesus died for you to save you, and they just don't really care. And I think big part of the reason is they don't understand why they should care, mm -hmm. which is why Romans uh, 1, 18 through 320 is maybe incredibly relevant for our society as much as it goes against the grain, because uh, we, we like to hear positive messages. It goes against the grain of what we are inclined to in our culture. It's maybe the most important message we can hear. And what do you think the root of, of sin is that Paul is talking about in these verses? What do you think the root of that sin is? Well, I think the root of that sin is the fallenness of, of us as human beings. And I think it's really interesting. You know, we oftentimes think of evil as something as outside of us. But what the Bible would describe is that the bigger problem is not just that there's evil in the world. It's that evil has infiltrated us. And it has gotten inside of us. It's wrapped its, you know, like a vine. It's wrapped its... Uh, tentacles around us and it's inside of us. It's wrapped into our hearts. And so what we need, and that's why it's such a tricky thing, you know, like you think about a surgeon, right? And he's got to remove cancerous growth without killing the patient. Sometimes that cancerous growth, for example, will wrap itself around a person's brain or their spinal cord. And that's what makes the surgery so difficult. How do you remove the cancerous growth, uh, the unhealthy growth without killing the person? And to a much greater degree, that's the dilemma that the Bible is all about, is how can God get rid of sin without getting rid of us? And the, the great news, the good news is that in Jesus, that's absolutely what he does. Yeah. And what, and what are we doing when we're sinning? Yeah. In essence, you know, one of the things that we talked about was believing God. So faith, mm -hmm. biblical faith is believing God to the point where you act on it, where you follow him, where you do what he says. And so essentially what that means is that when we are being faithless, in other words, we're sinning, uh, we are failing to believe certain things about God and we're failing to believe the gospel mm -hmm. in one way or another. So the, the person who overworks, uh, they're failing to believe that their justification is found in Christ, not in their own accomplishments. Mm -hmm. A person who you know, is licentious or goes into all kinds of immoral behavior, they're failing to believe that their truest, greatest fulfillment will ultimately be in Christ. They're failing to believe that, uh, that sin will be 
punished by God. You know, they're, they're failing to believe all these things. So it all comes back to this idea of believing the gospel and living by faith in the gospel, applying it to every area of our lives. Yeah. Amen. Well, I hope you continue on this journey with us. I was, I was going to leave you with a verse, um, just, you know, as we have to go through these first few chapters, and it does sometimes get a bit depressing as we look at the depravity as a, of our own souls. But I love the way, way Paul ends us in, in chapter 5. It says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And these, for even when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. And these are very comforting verses. And, and so stick with us as we continue through uh, the book of Romans. It's going to be an exciting journey. And uh, comment and like and subscribe. And let us know what you think. And may God bless you.